Hello everyone, my name is Emily Eberly with Saks Communications and I am your technical producer. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, The BUSE Project, which stands for Brooklyn Early Warning System, Early Identification, Early Intervention, Early Stabilization. And now I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Joel Horowitz, who is our moderator today. Dr. Horowitz has been the Vice Chairman of Surgery at Maimonides Medical Center for the past 30 years. He has always had a great interest in surgical safety and outcomes. He has been a surgeon champion of NSQIP for the past eight years and a surgeon champion mentor for the American College of Surgeons. He has participated in many facets of evidence-based medicine and was recently appointed as visiting professor of evidence-based surgery at Oxford University in the UK. Dr. Horowitz, welcome, and I'm so glad to be working with you for this special session, and we thank you for all of your support in moderating this important webinar for so many people today. Are you ready to get started? I am. Hi to everybody. Um, uh, good afternoon, and I guess good morning, too, globally. Thank you, Emily, for the very kind introduction. As you already saw, the title for today's webinar is Brooklyn Early Warning System Score rescuing the deteriorating patient. And speaking on this very timely topic is a colleague of mine here at Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn, Dr. Ronald Kalea. He is currently the Director of GI Surgical Oncology at the Maimonides Medical Center here in Brooklyn. His previous <coughs> academic positions included Professor of Clinical Surgery at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. He has served on the Board of Directors of the American Society of General Surgery and has published extensively in peer-reviewed journals on surgical and oncologic topics. He is a highly sought-after speaker and he has presented at numerous medical conferences regionally, nationally, and internationally. For the past 18 years, Dr. Kalea has been named as one of the best doctors in New York. Uh, he denies any conflicts of interest, and you should uh, recall that this activity is approved for one contact hour of continuing education for physicians, nurses, and respiratory therapists. You can read all the uh, ways of finding that out. Uh, the funding for this activity has been provided by Phillips, and a URL will be provided at the end of the webinar uh, to complete the evaluation. So, without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Kalea. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Horowitz. Um, my father would have liked to hear that introduction, and my mother would have believed it. Thank you all for joining this web presentation to hear about Maimonides Medical Center's experience using the Brooklyn Early Warning System in combination with medical co-management in our effort to improve the outcomes of the surgical patient. The learning objectives are um, that you should be able to deal with at the end of this activity is to discuss the impediments to rescue, describe the technologies necessary to reduce the response times, improve escalation, and in changes in workflow that are necessary to improve patient outcomes. And you should be able to dis discuss the cost efficacy and sustainability of this system. We are all aware that hospitalization is dangerous to people's health. Many hospital deaths are preventable and are due to failure to expeditiously diagnose and appropriately manage the deteriorating patient. Failure to rescue, in many cases, is a medical error. We glibly use the euphemistic terms such as failure to rescue and medical error. Failure to rescue is defined as death following an adverse event in a hospitalized patient. Gaffiri found that complication rates <clears throat> in the best and worst performing hospitals are the same, but the mortality was ha half that in the best performing hospitals. The incidence of complications was not as important as the ability to rescue the deteriorating patient from the complication. I perform surgery and sadly my patients suffer complications and some die. 
that's why this old surgical curmudgeon became passionate about rescuing patients when they deteriorate on the surgical ward. This is an eight-year chart of Maimonides Medical Center's patient safety indicator number four. It's a New York State reportable outcome measure of failure to rescue. As you can see, historically, <clears throat> our observed over expected failure to, to rescue ratios were at or slightly below unity. On a risk-adjusted basis, we were doing what was expected. But being average just wasn't good enough. So in 2014, we built booze, and in 2015, we refined it. As a result of the redesign, our failure to rescue rate fell to two-thirds, two-thirds of the expected failure to rescue rate in 2016. This talk, talk is the story of why and how we accomplished this remarkable improvement in surgical patient outcome. As background, several studies have shown that surgical outcomes are, in large part, determined not by what happens in the operating room, but the, by the quality of postoperative care. Early recognition of patients prone to bad outcomes is a key element of postoperative care. Retrospective analysis show that most patients exhibit signs of physiologic instability prior to critical clinical deterioration. Upwards of 80% of patients have altered vital signs in the 24 hours preceding the catastrophic or adverse event. More importantly, the early recognition and intervention, the better the um, outcome following deterioration. Review of patients who suffer adverse events has shown that they progress through successive stages of deterioration until the critical event rapid response or code activation. Early identification and management provides the best chance of rescue. This required a complete redesign of the traditional care model. The traditional workflow was physician-centric with escalations first to inexperienced providers, then up the chain to high-level providers. This model is and always was a complete disaster. This had to go, and it did. The sickest patients require the most experienced and capable providers for rapid diagnosis and management of the deterioration. Moreover, all patients, regardless of their clinical appearance, need predictive stratification of their risk for deterioration. Clinical intuition alone just doesn't cut it. Additionally, we had to honestly analyze the efficacy of booze so we could fix its flaws. Call that iterative redesign. We did all of these things in the course of the Booze Project. The classic way the deteriorating patient has been identified was the track and trigger model. Activation triggers are based on individual vital sign thresholds and clinical gestalt, such as the patient just doesn't look good. These thresholds have been arbitrarily established. These triggers and activation thresholds have not been validated to predict bad outcome. Most of the activation in the track and trigger model are for the late signs of deterioration, hypotension, tachypnea, or someone thinks that the patient looks like they're about to crash. Abnormal vital signs are common in both patients who die and patients who survive. The individual triggers are not accurate predictors of mortality or of adverse events. Even when a threshold is exceeded, the trigger is frequently ignored or minimized by the responding clinician and no escalation or intervention happens. This is what I call the will to live test. If they survive, they survive. Narrowing the trigger thresholds leads to increased false activations and again, don't predict adverse events. Early warning scores, on the other hand, are physiologic aggregate weighted scores based on six vital signs, blood pressure, oxygen saturation, pulse, respiratory rate, temperature, and mental status. These scores trend early and late determinants of deterioration. They have been developed by retrospectively analyzing 
patient outcomes related to the degree of deviation from normal vital signs. They have been validated retrospectively and prospectively to predict patient deterioration, myocardial infarction, ICU transfer, and death. Before we built the Brooklyn Early Warning System, we had to determine if these early warning scores gave disproportionate weight to the late signs of deterioration. We needed to know how accurately these scores predicted deterioration and what was the best trigger level for activation. Area under the receiver operator curve maps sensitivity versus specificity and when the value is greater than 0.8 it's very predictive. There are many different early warning scores, 33 of which were reviewed by Smith. Most are predictive of outcomes and have been validated. Smith's 2013 analysis showed that early warning scores reliably predicted death, myocardial infarction, and ICU transfer early in the patient's deterioration up to 24 hours prior to the adverse event. Clearly, anticipatory predictive modeling with early warning scores had to be integrated into the perioperative care of the surgical patients at Maimonides. As shown here, the vast majority of patients have scores less than three. Patients with scores greater than um, four are usually stabilized with fluids, diuresis, oxygen therapy. They could continue to be managed on the ward, saving resources and money. Very few required transfer to the intensive, or as we call it here, expensive care setting if appropriate preemptive inter intervention was done early in the course of deterioration. One size doesn't fit all. The same early warning score has different predictive values on the medical and surgical services. Raising the activation trigger decreases the sensitivity for predicting adverse events, but it increases the specificity. We had to make a compromise between resource utilization, alarm fatigue, workload, and the sensitivity to predict deterioration. More on this later. In, in a comparison between the traditional track and trigger and early warning score models, the odds ratio of predicting serious ad adverse events was eight times better using the early warning scores. Single variable track and trigger was out. Early warning scores was in on the Maimonides surgical service. As we were developing BOOS, Smith's analysis of the relationship between the early warning score, capture of serious adverse events, and the number of activations was used to determine the optimal activation trigger. With an early warning score of three, 90% of adverse events are captured. With, however, a third of the patients required an activation. This trigger of activation was too high in our estimation. In contrast, an activation trigger of five would capture 75% of adverse events with only 17% activation. We chose this as the, the initial activation trigger. As I will show later, this was a mistake, a very big mistake, and may have compromised our ability to rescue patients in the first two years of this project. Although early warning scores accurately predict patients at risk of deterioration, the routine use of early warning scores has not consistently translated into, improved, um, into an improvement in outcome. That's because their scores, numbers, not care delivery systems. I liken it to having a ripcord on a parachute. If you don't pull the ripcord, the chute doesn't open. It's what you do with the score that matters. While many, pa many other groups have tried to make the sensitivity and specificity of the early warning score better, we thought the current scores were good enough and dealt with the practical aspects of integrating the score into an effective care delivery system. We believe that BOOS is that system. This is a schematic of the technical aspects of the BOOS system. The patient care technician takes the vital signs, 
every four hours on all patients. It is wirelessly transferred to the responsible note nurse who validates the results in real time. The BOO score and escalation criteria become immediately visible on the monitor at the time of validation. The result, results are wirelessly uploaded to a server immediately after the validation takes place. And that distributes the information to the communication and the information system servers. Other institutions have used the electronic medical record to calculate the early warning score, which is dependent upon timely manual vital sign entry into the EMR. In our wireless system, there is no manual inputting of vital sign information. It's uploaded immediately, not at the end of the shift. The communication server distributes the information <clears throat> to appropriate providers based on a BOO score escalation algorithm. Only scores exceeding given thresholds are sent out wireless wirelessly to handheld devices with voice over internet capability. There is redundancy in this system with a second escalation if the first is not responded to in a timely fashion. The voice over internet is yet another backup. The primary nurse can call directly to the responder and ask, where the hell are you? This other server maps to the EMR and to the IntelliView dashboard, so the clinician can access the BOO scores and alert information anywhere in the hospital or remotely via the internet. There were a lot of um, obstacles to the physical build of the BOO's infrastructure. There was no other system like the one we proposed, so overt plagiarism was out. We were unhappy about that. We had to design it, build it, map the results to our um, electronic medical record and to the communication system. The Wi-Fi capability of the vital sign monitors relied on old, slow, short-range wireless protocols. There were no standardized communication protocols, so the different servers did not like to talk to one another. It was like the Tower of Babel where no one spoke the same language and no one spoke with one another. The IT people and the manufacturers of the mount monitors were tasked with solving this problem they were very unhappy. It took a year, all of 2014, to make this system work seamlessly. Well, almost seamlessly. Once it was built, we, we tried to use it to deal with the impediments to rescue. The impediments to rescue have been described extensively in the nursing and medical literature. Combined with our experience, these were some of the impediments that could be addressed by the BOOS system. Poor or incomplete patient assessment, or just failure to recognize deterioration was overcome, in part with the use of the early warning score. Delayed communication using paging systems. The primary nurse pages the resident or the nurse practitioner. When there's no answer, the nurse has be already become preoccupied by their five other patients and there is a delay in escalation. There was no redundancy in the old system. This was addressed with automated communication to ha the handheld device. Furthermore, the reluctance to escalate an escalation to an inexperienced provider delays appropriate intervention. This was solved by algorithmically choosing the correct high-level experienced provider based on the BOO score, the right care right now. These impediments to rescue are common even when early warning scores are used. In a large university hospital, up to 80% of patients were missing one or more of the vital signs, making early warning score calculation impossible. Compliance with scheduled vital signs occurred in only two-thirds of the patients. And when the early score was calculated by hand, 43% were missing a parameter and the early score, um, warning score was correctly calculated in only one out of five patients. Booz, on the other hand, has automated and mandated vital sign determinations. They're tracked. The Booz score is calculated on the monitor once the vitals are ver uh, verified in real time and wirelessly uploaded to the clinical information system. 
immediate wireless alerts are generated by the escalation algorithm without clinical input. Historically, escalation is to a low-level provider. In my teaching hospital before booze, the intern or night float resident was the first to receive the alert. Unfortunately, they're just medical students plus a couple of months. The most inexperienced person is asked to assess the sickest patients. It just didn't make any sense. Consider this. The, the call goes out to that a patient is tachycardic. The inexperienced provider decides that the postoperative patient is tachycardic because of hypovolemia and gives a fluid bolus. Two hours later, the patient is still tachycardic, so they give oxygen. Two hours later, that didn't work. So maybe the patient is fluid overload and they give a diuretic with no effect. The patient is then given morphine because now it's determined that the cause of the tachycardia is pain and, and so on and so forth. By the time a sentient life form, an experienced provider gets involved, the stool and the fan have already interfaced and the next call is to the rapid response or code team. It just didn't make sense. Furthermore, Due, the, due to the vertical and sequential escal escalation paradigm, low-level providers are afraid to escalate. It exposes inadequacy, and they fear recrimination. Escalation to the attendings were previously with met, were met with, why are you calling me? Take care of the problem. Which, when something went wrong, was followed by, why didn't you call me earlier? In contrast, Booz has defined escalation criteria to experienced providers. They're automated. The right people respond to the deteriorating patient, reducing the delay to appropriate intervention. Booze is a patient-centric, with real-time, dynamic, physiologic risk stratification of all patients on the surgical service. That's personalized medicine. It's proactive rather than reactive, and uses enabling technologies to reduce response times to the right personnel. Unlike all of our experience with the EMRs, we have used technology to en enhance care. During the same period of time, we initiated other surgical safety programs. 95% of patients who have an ASA greater than or equal to three have a formal preoperative medical assessment by the hospitalist service or patient or the patient's private internist. You can't get into the operating room without it. We perform risk stratification using the physiologic and operative severity score for enumeration of mortality and morbidity, or POSM for short, and the National Surgical Quality Improvement Project's risk assessment tools. Sicker patients are co-managed by internists in the perioperative period. Or, and the hospitalists proactively intervene when there is a rising booze score that's below the activation trigger. We have incorporated booze score into our resident handoffs as well. This is a, a snapshot of the Guardian dashboard. Patients who, whose score is three, like these two, will have a preemptive visit by the hospitalist during the day, and the rapid response nurse practitioner overnight whenever possible, but not always yet. This is our BOOS scoring chart. Because we instituted the program on a surgical service, we chose to add a point to the score if the patient was less than 24 hours post-op or was transferred from a unit, had a B high BMI, sleep apnea, or was noted to have low urine output. The nurse who verifies the vitals adds this point. The escalation algorithm is shown here. The Guardian Vital Sign Monitor displays the next step in the escalation algorithm directly on the monitor once the BOO score is verified. And these, are the, these things show right up on the, um, on the monitor. The Guardian Vital Sign Monitor is shown here with the display of the calculated booze as well as the drivers of that calculation. This window shows 
the escalation protocol once the booze score is calculated. When analyzing our 2015 results, we were unhappy. There was not the improvement in mortality that we had predicted. We chose the activation threshold of five, and this was just wrong. Using this information, we changed the escalation trigger threshold to boos of four from the initial trigger of five. We also condensed the algorithm into three rather than four categories. The new categories were observe, warning, and urgent. The entire escalation protocol was reworked and the monitors were reprogrammed to display the newer, simpler algor algorithm. So these are our results. There is a greater than 95% compliance with BOO scores on all surgical patients six times a day, every four hours. Our vice president of surgical nursing just wouldn't have it any other way. To date, we have almost 12,000 patients on the system with almost 200,000 unique BOO scores. In 2016, there were 637 escalations for BOOs greater than or equal to four. 21 patients died, many of whom were on, the palli were on palliative care and others who had catastrophic events such as a fatal myocardial infarction or pulmonary embolus. Of the 15 patients who were transferred to the unit from the floor, 14 were rescued and left the hospital. Most of the others just needed adjustments in fluid therapy, oxygen, pulmonary toilet, diuresis, or antibiotics. Mortality for the 2015 and 2016 cohorts are compared. The activation trigger was changed from five to four in the successive years. Because these, these numbers represent the highest BOO score when the activation occurs. Because the BOO score is not obtained continuously, a patient can go from a score of two to six in the time between determinations without going through four. There are about 6,000 patients in each year. Most of the BOO scores of eight and nine were errors and inappropriately validated. They were included for completeness. We believe that's why these mortalities are so low. Overall, the mortality for the surgical service by changing the BOO score from five to four went from 6.95% to 3.3%. We didn't really believe the, our results. These were our internal calculations. We were surprised. Our internal analysis seemed to um, suggest that we were making progress. But we received the New York State Reportable Patient Safety Indicator 4 for 2016. The failure to rescue in the observed over expected fell from 1.02 to 0.65, a 35% reduction in risk adjusted mortality. External validation of good internal results is a wonderful thing. At the end of March, we received an email from the Director of Quality Outcomes, and I just have to quote it. We finalized the failure to rescue data for 2016, the lowest odds ratio in history. Time to celebrate, and celebrate we did. We also evaluated the morbidity based on our NISQIP vascular data before and after booze and co-management were instituted. The NISQIP risk calculator is a risk-adjusted predictor of surgical outcome. Comparisons of outcomes in sequential years is not a great research method, but we were looking at the same patients, the same surgeons, the same staff in a risk-adjusted manner. It's not perfect. As seen here, we reduced our observed overexpected death rate from 1.45 to 0.43. More vascular patients left the hospital after booze and co-management was started. Our observed overexpected complication rate also fell from 1.39 to 0.98. And by multiplying the delta observed overexpected by the expected complication rate at, um, 
as predicted by the risk calculator, approximately 10 patients out of every 100 were spared a complication. To have this, the cost of co-management is about a million dollars a year. The co-managers see approximately 100 patients per month or 1,200 patients per year. At a cost of a million dollars, each co-managed patient increased the cost of care by $850. By comparison, there, the complications are very expensive as well. In a literature review by Zog, the real cost of any complication is about $9,000. With a reduction of 10 complications per 100 patients treated, each complication costing the hospital $9,000, the hospital saves approximately $90,000 per 100 patients co-managed, recouping about $900 per patient. It's a financial wash, and that's, it doesn't include the benefits of improved patient outcomes, decreased length of stay, reduced liability costs, better documentation of comorbidity by the medical hospitalist, increasing the case mix index. Surgeons don't do such a good job at coding medical comorbid comorbidities. We also prefer, performed a survey of caregivers and patients. The nursing staff reported that the booze and co-management um, provided a safer environment, better communication, and improved care of the unstable patient. The surgical residents were delighted because they, were, they learned how to manage medical diseases, diabetes, hypertension, and other medical issues from an internist, not a surgeon. The patients, despite lots of patient education material, perceived no benefit. We're developing outcome reports looking at survival, response times, and the details of what was done during the escalation. In addition, we're looking at whether the average booth score can be used to determine appropriate staff, staffing levels on the wards. A ward with an average booze of one needs less resources than one with an average booze of two. We're expanding into other areas of the hospital a plan to enlarge the system to all inpatient units. A booze crew, which would be like the rapid response team, but for preemptive intervention based on a booze score of three is planned. We have applied for a hospital grant to expand the system into the emergency um, room triage and to monitor deteriorating patients during their stay in the emergency department. Ultimately, we'd like to place continuous monitors on patients admitted but awaiting transfer to an inpatient bed. In our emergency department, this is a period of time when the accepting service isn't in direct contact with the patient, and the emergency department has relinquished its responsibility to the inpatient team. We believe we built a safer surgical service by rede redesigning the workflow, instituting dynamic, automated risk stratification for the early diagnosis of patient deterioration, and the use of linking technologies to alert clinicians without the delays caused by paging systems and others. In addition, the system is preemptive with real-time risk mitigating strategies to reduce the time to intervention and reduce the variability of the response by experienced providers. The right care right now. So overall, the booze and co-management program addresses many of the impediments to rescue and provides a safer surgical environment for our patients. I would like to give credit to our Booze crew and the many colleagues who embrace the vision and help make the Booze project a reality. Thank you for your attention and participation in this webinar. I look forward to answering your questions. I'd like to hand the, the microphone back to Dr. Horowitz who will mo moderate the question and answer session. <clears throat> Thank you, Ron. That was uh, very well done and uh, very informative. So uh, it was read before, but this activity is approved for one contact hour. And to obtain uh, your contact hour, log on to uh, www.saxtesting.com forward slash bo. If you do the uh, evaluation successfully, 
uh, you'll be able to print your certificate right off the bat. Uh, we have a lot of questions, uh, many of which uh, overlap. Gory asked a, a very interesting question, which I think you partially uh, addressed. And the question is, uh, have you seen or studied better outcomes when the score is calculated more frequently? In other words, should you do it every 15 minutes uh, in order to avoid any kind of um, uh, deterioration? Well, it's, it's interesting because actually the data shows that if you measure the early warning score, any time within the first 24 hours prior to an event, you'll pick it up. This has been mandated, for example, in most European centers. Uh, in America, we're uh, rather new to the game, uh, but uh, in all the Scandinavian countries, for example, and, I, and one of the uh, references that Ron gave you uh, was uh, directly related to that. So no, there's no need to do this as a continuous measurement, then it becomes uh, absolutely impossible. Uh, after all, these are patients who are, uh, you know, in a regular post-operative ward. This is not a, uh, a high acuity situation. So, no, um, I don't think that uh, two hours is too long. I think it's absolutely appropriate and uh, probably or may be able to be cut down a little sooner. So I hope that answers your question. So uh, Eric uh, asked uh, actually two very cogent questions. One is um, how did you get buy-in from uh, the leadership or I guess he was meaning the bean counters because there has to be a cash outlay here in order to be able to do this system. And uh, I must say that the leadership at Maimonides Medical Center was quick to point, was quick to find out rather that what's good for the patients is good for the hospital. And especially if um, uh, you could show that uh, this was perhaps linked uh, to decreasing uh, outpay, uh, out uh, uh, put uh, from uh, the legal team as well as um, a buy-in from physicians who are very happy to have the best uh, care provided to their hospitals. So I think that's uh, the way to uh, get buy-in from uh, the bean counters. Eric also asked uh, about uh, uh, any fault or, or what the uh, by changing the uh, early warning score did we have more uh, uh, false alarms and I think that uh, question was also addressed it's an excellent question uh, the answer is that uh, if the thing is done correctly we want to know when we get a score of four or more and uh, we did not find that it was a burdensome thing uh, and uh, we so we did not uh, increase the number of false alarms uh, by having an accurate system. Uh, someone else had also asked whether it cut down on RRT calls, uh, and I think the answer to that is uh, yes, it did. Okay, so Deborah called in and wants to know how accurate are you guys at measuring the respiratory rate? That's traditionally been a very um, iffy thing to do. So <clears throat> actually we're looking at that right now. It is one of the major components of, um, of escalation um, or high boost score. And you know we always get around that you know the, res the respiratory rate on everyone is 18 or 16. And um, we're thinking of adding a respiratory monitor to the system to more accurately um, determine the respiratory rate. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so here's another an interesting question uh, from Deborah, but I, th I think Deborah's, Deborah's really into this because she's asked three questions. She says, uh, in a non-teaching hospital, i.e. no medical students or residents, would you still recommend an RRT call at a level of seven? At a level of seven, I would at a level of seven, it's more likely that you're going to call the code team. But yes, you you would I would escalate to the RRT above four. I mean, by the time you get to seven, your chances of rescue decrease as the boost score goes up. 
Okay, I have a question here from Amy. Uh, what EMR system do you use at your hospital, Ron? All scripts. Sunrise Clinical something. Sun Sunrise <laughs> Clinical Manager. SCM. Yes. SCM. <laughs> So several people asked that uh, very question, and uh, well, so the real issue here is that the people who make the uh, who make the monitors never built an interface to upload this directly into the EMR, and so we had to build that interface, um, which was very difficult. You had to map it, all the vital signs to the EMR appropriately through a server that talked the same language as the um, monitor and talked the same language as the um, it was not um, it was not a pretty site okay I have another question for you uh, Dr. Kalea uh, Megan wrote in and uh, asked uh, do you see an early warning system being beneficial in the skilled nursing facility setting and what do you suggest for a setting that does not have the technical monitoring and or EMR? I think it may be helpful, but you would have to change the activation triggers. Um, just as on the medical service, there's going to be a different um, activation, um, a set of activations because and escalation criteria <clears throat> because they're different patients. Um, I never really thought about a um, skilled nursing facility. I can't answer that question with any kind of, you know, with any reasonable uh, accuracy. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll just chime in on that. I agree with you there. I think that that uh, brings up an issue which, uh, for cost purposes and the ability to respond uh, to this uh, level of uh, deterioration, I don't think it's appropriate for that sort of facility. I don't think it's possible to do that for that sort of facility, uh, given uh, the current state of uh, where we are. Um, <clears throat> so, Dr. Ron, there's a question here from Ronald. Uh, how much, if any, have you relied on the rest of your EMR system to support better patient care? You don't want to ask that question, do you? I mean, I just did. <laughs> I, I don't think that the EMR or any EMR at this point it um, improves patient care. I think that it obscures important information and it doesn't lead to better communication between providers. So I'm not a big fan. Um, I think that it's very nice that we have all this information in the um, in a record, but what it is, it's a um, a flat relational. Um, it's it's a relational database that's not being used appropriately at this time because it doesn't help you in diagnosis or in ma management at this point. Yeah, I agree with you there. So I have a couple of questions here, uh, Dr. Kalea. Uh, <clears throat> we have a very uh, high level of audience uh, because several people have asked uh, about whether you considered adding end tidal CO2 monitoring to your scoring and uh, <clears throat> what do you think about incorporating uh, ETCO2 into the um, system? Well, we actually tried that. We did that for our um, patients undergoing obesity surgery and we were able to move those patients out of the step-down unit postoperatively and observe them on the floor with continuous CO2 monitoring. The problem is with side stream CO2 monitoring. Uh, it's inaccurate. Sometimes you're getting um, a CO2 monitoring from the ear as the um, nasal cannula rotates on the patient's head. It has, incredibly, um, it has an incredible number of false alarms. The nurses in the room constantly trying to put the nasal cannula on. Um, water blocks the uh, system too frequently. I think it's a technology, that was our goal initially, was to use end tidal CO2 as one of the 
additional vital signs. But at this time, I don't think the technology is reliable enough. Um, and what it really does require, one of the things that it requires is that you get a baseline, at least Venus um, PCO2, to um, calibrate the, um, the end tidal monitor. We use it in the units almost exclu um, exclusively at this point. Yeah, I would also add that uh, the, our original concept was that we would use this for morbidly obese patients who had obstructive sleep apnea as part of their monitoring. But that's a different, little bit different situation. So Dr. Kalea, we've got uh, a question here. Uh, would booze integrate into EPIC, for example? I'm sure it would. It would require yeah, it some. Does. It does. It, uh, it will. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, it does. It would require some program, programming. Yes. Uh, so here's a question from uh, Kathleen, uh, which I think it's important to be able to answer. Is it mandatory to have Philips equipment for monitoring, or could some other provider's equipment be fitted with the criteria for scoring? Can't answer that question. I don't know the other. Um, and, uh, yeah, this is the stuff I work with. Um, the hospital bought this. I used what I had. I don't know if um, you can do it with other equipment. I don't know how many of the other equipments have wireless uploads. And I think mm -hmm. that the wireless part of it is really important because it doesn't delay entry of the vital signs into the, um, into the system and it doesn't slow down escalations. Okay. Um, so Maria has just uh, put in the following. Uh, we use Muse with an RRT at five. Last year, we had 72 RRT and one code of a 92-year-old. I fully uh, support your project. Do you have publications to share with uh, physician leaders? No, we don't have any publications yet. Um, but we will we just, soon. <laughs> we will soon. Yeah. Um, a lot of this information is going to be presented at um, Evidence Live um, at um, Oxford in the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine in a month. Yes, there will be a presentation in June uh, at the Evidence Live meeting and uh, there will be a publication which uh, comes out uh, from that. This would be a good thing to be able to show to people. So uh, Scott's uh, uh, asked an important question here, Ron, and that is with the reliance on technology, what approach is utilized for an unexpected interrupt in, interruption in transmission of data or server maintenance in order to maintain continuity? Well, we've had the server go down um, in the past because the booze monitor, um, the monitor that we do it on, has the escalation criteria already in it. That requires our communication servers um, get held up. I don't care how long it takes to get it into the EMR, and I don't care how long it takes to get to the dashboard. The, pro the problem is that it, it, the escalation um, doesn't happen automatically, and then, then it has to go to manual. But we have the voice over internet in our, um, in all, every nurse on the, on the service, on the, on the ward, as, um, as a handheld device with voice over the internet, and they can escalate directly. Um, so I have got a couple of, uh, we have not much time left, but there are two questions here that I think we ought to get to. Uh, the first is uh, from Jerry. What kind of resources did it take to build the system in both staff and dollars? I think that's an excellent question. Well, it's expensive. So on, on our surgical ward, it took 10 of these um, vital sign monitors at about $10,000 a piece. And then there was about um, another qu quarter of a million dollars spent on building the infrastructure. Now that we know how to build the infrastructure, because we had to design it, we had to map everything. So there was a lot of um, IT money that went into um, making the communication systems work. Um, right now, I think that the servers are not expensive, and the um, 
the details of how to map it are um, are much more much clearer because you can plagiarize our system. Um, so I suspect to do it on a, our ward of 70 patients, it probably um, would to re replicate it, and we are replicating it on other wards. We anticipate that it will cost about $150,000 per ward with 70 patients on it. And uh, Ron, how much does the, each monitor cost? I said about ten thousand dollars. I don't. 000. I don't. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what they get. I mean, there's all kinds of, you know, reductions, and you're a hospital, and you have, yeah. you know, you know, I, I don't know the details of the actual costs. Okay. Now here we have. We're getting right to the end here. Uh, Lori has asked about exploring the value of implementing an early warning system in the uh, PACU. What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. You have to change the escalation criteria, but I think that that it, and that's one of the places that we're bringing the, um, the um, booze to very soon. It's to determine where the patients go, whether they should go to the ward, whether they should go to the, um, the progressive care unit or the ICU. We've had some we've had some errors where we sent people inappropriately to the floor, and if you looked at their, if you manually cal calculate their booze. It's very clear that they should they should have gone to a unit environment. Okay, I think we've uh, arrived at the uh, at the end of the question period. Uh, so unless I see something pop up on my screen here, I think we can uh, say thank you very much for participating in this event. And I'd like to thank you very much for your time, both Dr. Kalia, for this informative presentation, and as well to you, Dr. Horowitz, for being our moderator today. And I'd like to thank each and every one of you, our guests in the live audience, and as well those of you in a future time who are attending this recorded session. We thank you for your time and your thoughtful attention. And now this does conclude our session for today. Take care, everyone, and bye for now. We'll see you again next time.